I've entitled today's message, Do You Have Jesus Values? Do you have Jesus values in your life? The dictionary defines values as a person's principles or standards of behavior. Are we sure that the, uh, that the camera is recording? I don't see a red light on. There we go. A uh, dictionary defines values as a person's principles or standards of behavior. One's judgment of what is important in life. And so what we value in life determines our priorities. It determines our thoughts, what we value, we think about. It determines our actions, what we do in our lives. And so our values are very, very important. Proverbs 10, verse 2 says, Ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. And so a treasure that's accumulated by sinful methods, we might think, oh, that's, you know, this person's got a lot of money. It is of no value. It's of no value to God, first and foremost. And really, if we think about what is true value, it's not going to do any value to the person either. However, righteousness, which is living rightly before God, is of great value. It says it's able to deliver somebody from death. Righteousness delivers us from eternal death, which is the greatest value that there, that there actually is. Matthew chapter 13, verse 45, Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in this short parable, very important parable, Jesus likens the kingdom of God to a, a fine pearl of great value. I don't know a lot about pearls, but you know, they're in clams or something and they grow in there, but there are perfect pearls. There are large pearls and those kind of pearls have enormous value even today. And so, this pearl that this merchant found had great value. And Jesus is speaking of the kingdom of God as that pearl of great price. It has great value. And how valuable is it? Well, this merchant sold everything that he had, sold all of his assets, so that he could purchase this pearl of great price. And so the point of Jesus' story is that having the kingdom of God, entering into the kingdom of God, is of the greatest value. It's of such value that we should give up everything else we have in order to enter into God's kingdom, to inherit the kingdom of God. Now there are good values that we should have, and there are values that are not so good. Bad values. The good values that we should have are things that God values. The bad values, God doesn't value. In fact, Luke 16, 15, Jesus says, what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So the things that the world values around us, God does not value. He detests the values of the world around us. And the Bible tells us the values of the world are trying to squeeze us as believers into its mold. They want to pressure us into having the same values as the world around us. And that's what our culture is trying to do to us. What are some of the world's values that God detests? Well, we could go on a long list, but we'll just go into some of the things that are at the top of the news. The world values a woman's choice to kill her own child. That is a value to a large part of the world around us. God detests that selfish value and he gives great value to every child who is conceived from the moment of conception. He values every child's life. The world values children being manipulated into choosing a gender different than what they were born with. And in fact, more and more having their bodies surgically mutilated at a young age. 
to attempt to change their gender. God detests those values. He values every boy and girl who has been created in the image of God. God detests homosexual behavior. He desires every person to be set free from it. To be the person that God created them to live according to the gender that he created them with. The world values homosexual behavior and celebrates it. Now, God loves every, each and every person, and so should we. But the values of the world are detestable to God. The world values money, it values pride, it values fame. But the Bible says that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so today we want to learn more about God's values from some of Jesus' teaching. So that the things that Jesus values could be the things that we value. And as we begin to value the things or grow in valuing the things that God values, that Jesus values, those values are going to be very different from the people around us, the unbelievers around us in the world. But that's okay. In fact, that's how God designed it to be. Because as we live by God's values, it's going to be God's light shining through us and pushing back the darkness of the world around us. God wants us to be different. The world tries to pressure us into being just like the world around us. But it's a good thing to be different when you're living for God and living by his values. First value we're going to talk about is Jesus values healing. Our story begins in Luke chapter 14, verse 1. It says, one Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. They were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had Dropsy. So Jesus loved to eat with different types of people, from the lowliest people to the high class people. He ate with everything in between, from the low to the high. And in this instance, he went to a dinner party, probably after the Sabbath service in the synagogue, and it was hosted by a leading Pharisee. So this would be a person who was very high up in the Jewish religion of the day. And it says the other Jewish leaders, he invited a number of his fellow leaders, were watching Jesus closely. Now this was not to learn from Jesus. This was to try to trap Jesus, to catch him in something that he would say that they could use to, as I was thinking about it, cancel him. You know, that's today's world. They did it back then too. You know, like Jesus said this, we're going to spread it around and nobody's going to like him. Nobody's going to listen to him anymore. They wanted to cancel Jesus in the eyes of the people. And along with this host of the dinner party and his buddies, Jesus was there. There was also an unusual person there. It was a man who had dropsy. This is a serious swelling disease. It can have different causes, but it's usually something serious. He's got a liver problem or a heart problem or something, and fluid is accumulating in his limbs. Most likely, as we'll see, the Jewish leaders brought this man to the dinner party, not as a guest, but to trap Jesus. We'll talk more about that as we go on. Verse 3, And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him, this is the man with dropsy, and healed him and sent him away. So Jesus knew what was on the mind of, of all of these Jewish leaders there. He knew what they were thinking. And so he asked them this question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? In other words, does God's word forbid healing somebody on the Sabbath day? Now, why was this a question? Well, the Bible says that on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work, right? It's in the Ten Commandments. And what does that mean? It means whatever your regular work week is, back then they worked, well, if they were Jews, six days a week and they rested. We typically work five days a week. We've got it really easy these days. But you were supposed to take one day off of the week to rest and not do the work that you did the rest of the week. It's good for you. And during that day that you rest, 
you're to spend part of that day at least worshiping God, a day to rest and to worship. Now, the Jews had invented all kinds of rules and regulations to determine what was work. Like, you could lift a, a stick that weighed just a little bit, was not work, but if it weighed a little bit more than a certain amount, then it was work. And that was illegal. You couldn't do that. And so it was an open question whether you could heal somebody. Was healing somebody on the Sabbath work or not? And the Jewish leaders and Pharisees had concluded that it was work and it should not be done. Well, Jesus had other ideas. Uh, Jesus didn't agree with the rules and regulations of the Pharisees, and so he reached out his hand, put it on the man with dropsy, and healed him. And, he was, and, and, and the man was immediately healed. And it says the man was sent away, and to me that implies he was not one of the invited guests at the party. The rest of the guests were still there, but this man had just been brought to see what would happen. And so Jesus then addressed the people watching this, the other lawyers and Pharisees there. He said to them, which of you having a son or ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. And so Jesus asked these guys and another question. It had to do with their values. What did they value? He said, suppose you have, I'll start first with the ox, an ox that falls into a well. Now, an ox was uh, worth a lot of money. The oxen would pull plows and do different work around the farm and in the fields. And if a, uh, an oxen fell into a well and remained there, he would die and they would be out a lot of money. So they valued this ox and so they would do whatever they could to pull, get this ox out of the well on the Sabbath so he wouldn't die down there. Now, even more valuable would be one of their sons fell into a well. Would you leave him down there for the whole day till Monday? No, you'd do whatever you could to get him out immediately. And so the question is, um, which of you would pull him out? They, they all knew in their hearts, yeah, I would, I would rescue my boy if he fell into a well even on the Sabbath or even an ox. Now, Jesus' point was that this man who had dropsy, who was ill, had great value. And God loved him so much, Jesus loved him so much, that he was going to heal him and deliver him from this illness that probably was going to eventually kill him. Deliver him from the suffering that he'd lived with for we don't know how many years. To, in effect lift him out of this well of sickness and bring him back into life with everybody else. And so Jesus healed him and brought this man to wholeness. And so Jesus values healing far above any man-made rules and regulations. So let's bring this scripture into our world today. Jesus knew that if he healed the man, he would in essence, get in trouble with all these Jewish leaders. He knew that would be a consequence of healing this man because they had different values than Jesus did. And he was confronting their values by healing this man. He knew he would get in trouble, but he did it anyway. Why? Because he had different values. He valued the healing power of God that was operating through him to bring wholeness to the man. He said, whenever he healed somebody, the kingdom of God drew near. It was a demonstration of the power of the kingdom, that the supernatural kingdom can make a difference in the natural world around us. Jesus valued healing because he valued people. And he wanted to alleviate the suffering in people. Let's think about us today. When, when we see someone that is ill or disabled or sick, do we do what Jesus did? Make it a high value to see that they're healed. To pray for them. Not just like a little silent prayer, you know, I'm going to let anybody know, Jesus healed them. But do we talk to them? Do we lay our hands on them? Do we pray for them to be healed? Why not? What are the first thoughts that come to our mind when we 
see someone who's sick or ill or disabled, and we hear a little whisper of the Holy Spirit, why don't you go pray for them? What are the thoughts that come into our minds? If you're like me, it might be, I don't know if this is an appropriate time, God. What will they think of me? Maybe they'll think I'm some kind of religious fanatic. Maybe they'll scream and say, get away. What if I pray for them and nothing happens? I mean, maybe this person is somebody I know. It's not just a stranger. It's somebody I know. How is this going to affect my relationship? Maybe they, they'll think I've just gone bonkers. And we could go on and on. Now, as we think about all these excuses and other ones that you may have in your own head when the Spirit prompts you to pray for someone, what are they all focused on? They're all focused on me. How am I going to feel? How is this going to affect me? And they all have to do with fear, the fear of man. What, what will other people think of me? That's what they're all focused on. They're focused on me and my feelings, not on the person's suffering and the need of that person for healing. They're focused on us and not on Jesus' values. Well, the exact same situation can occur when we feel the Holy Spirit prompting us to witness or talk to somebody about spiritual matters or about the gospel. And we'll have all these thoughts. And if you think about it carefully, it's all about me. It's all about you, why you can't do it. It's not about the other person who needs to hear the word of God. Jesus did not care what other people thought about him. He was going to do what God told him to do no matter what. He knew some would believe in him, and he knew some would reject him. And the same is going to be true for us today. We shouldn't care about what other people think of us as we're following God's promptings to bring healing into people's lives. And so our value should be Jesus' values, and one of those values is healing. Now, healing is a broad topic, as I say often, there's physical healing, there's emotional healing, there's spiritual healing, and there are needs for healing in people all around us. Not only does Jesus value healing, he values humility. And these are all related, as we'll see. Verse 7. Now, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. So Jesus is still at this dinner party. We're still in the same story. He's still in the same house. He just healed this man from a serious disease. He was watching all the different dinner guests, and he saw how they seated themselves. And what they were doing, they were jockeying for the best seats. Or maybe there was a little pushing and shoving to see who could get seated next to, I assume, this host of the party, this influential Pharisee, or, or maybe they were even jockeying to sit Next to Jesus, I don't know. But the best seats, they were all trying to get to the best seats. And those seeking to choose the best seats in the house were revealing what they valued in their lives. And so Jesus said to them, and Jesus did not, he was not afraid of offending people. A lot of the things he said, people were offended as I'm sure they were by this. He says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. So Jesus tells them a little story, but it is directly related to what's going on at the dinner party that he's at. It's a little bit different. It's a wedding feast. But it's still they were eating together. And he says, if you're at a wedding feast, don't do this. The story was aimed right at his fellow dinner guests because they'd been doing exactly what he is telling them not to do. They've been seeking out places of honor. And they weren't supposed to do that because the host may come in and say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be here. Go sit at the foot of the table, not at the head. And then they would be ashamed. Rather than being honored, they would end up being dishonored. 
What are they supposed to do? It says in verse 10, when you are invited, go and sit at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so rather than seeking to sit at the highest place, the best place at the table, you should seek to go to the lowest place, the place farthest away from the head table. And if you do that, the host may well come and say, hey, come on up to the head table, and you will be exalted. The principle is if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. If you humble yourself, you will be exalted. And so Jesus values humility over pride. And so should we in our own lives. Let's talk about how this affects us today. A proud person values himself above everybody else. Not only does a proud person value himself over others, he tries to make sure others know that he's better than them. That's why they wanted to sit at the head table. First of all, they thought, I'm pretty good. I deserve to sit here. Secondly, they wanted everybody else to know how important, how influential they were. Pride is a value of the world, and we see it all around us. Humility is what Jesus valued, and so should we. A proud person is very concerned about what other people think of him. The fear of man is rooted in pride. We're afraid of what other people because they might think ill of us. A humble person is really not concerned about what other people think about you. A humble person is only concerned about what God thinks about you. And so the fear of God, fearing God, and not fearing man leads to humility. A humble person, well, let's start with a proud person. A proud person deserves or desires to be served by other people. Because he's so great, he's so wonderful, everybody ought to serve me. A humble person, on the other hand, seeks to serve those around them. They want to help others. They want to serve others. They want to take the lowly place. And of course, I'm reminded right now of the, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, taking the low place, humbling himself to serve. An example for us. A humble person considers other people as more important than themselves. A proud person is exactly the opposite. I'm the most important person, and all you others just are there for my benefit. A proud person doesn't want to serve others at work, in their family, in their neighborhood, in the church. A humble person is always seeking to serve, to help other people, whether it's at work, whether it's in the family, whether it's in the church family. The Bible teaches us that God opposes the proud. Now, when you have the Creator, the God of the universe, opposing you, it's not a good thing. God opposes the proud. I don't want God opposing me because He's going to win. Uh, I don't have a chance if God opposes me. Nothing I try to do is going to work. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He empowers, he helps the humble. And so Jesus values humility. Healing humility. And finally, Jesus values generosity. Verse 12, he said also to the man who had invited him. Now he's talking to the host. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. So Jesus now, you know, he's offended just about everybody at the party. Now he turns to the host, the one who invited him. And he says to him directly, you know, then this is a prominent Jewish leader, probably the most prominent person there at the dinner party. He says, now when you invite people to a dinner, don't invite your friends, relatives, and rich neighbors. What has this guy just done? He'd just done that. He'd invited all the people that were high ups, people that were rich, people that were her fr his friends. Those were the people there. The feast was filled with influential people. 
Now, why shouldn't a person invite those people, those kind of people? Because the motive inviting those kind of people is you're doing it for whose benefit? For your benefit. It's not to be nice to all these people. He was inviting them for his benefit so that they could repay him, so that they could invite him to their dinner parties and he would be known across the city. Rather, what should you do? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, these kind of people are not going to be able to do anything for your fame or your fortune or your career. Those kind of people are needy people. And so when you invite them, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for them. You're doing to help somebody. When you invite the poor, you are being generous. You're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about receiving. You're thinking about giving. In fact, there was one lame person at the dinner party. But I don't think the host invited him. It doesn't say directly, but I think that just the story, he didn't invite him. And Jesus was saying, that's the kind of person you should have invited. What will be the result when you're generous, when you're not seeking a return for yourself? And you will be blessed because they, the poor, cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And so if you're generous, you think, I'm just going to miss out. All I'm going to do is give. He says, no, you're not going to miss out. You're going to be blessed. I believe he's saying you're going to be blessed in this life in many different ways. And you're going to be repaid many times over in eternity. You see, being generous is a mark. It's a value of people who are righteous. People who are going to inherit eternal life. And being stingy, only helping those you think are going to help you, is a worldly value. And so Jesus values generosity, and so should we. So generosity can apply to our money, it can apply to our time, it can apply to our possessions. Do we hoard those things all for ourselves, or do we share what we have, and everything we have is a gift from God? Do we share that with others around us? Do we only give to someone if we think, hmm, if I give to them, yeah, they're probably going to you know, give something back to me, so I'm really not going to lose anything there. Or do we share not expecting a return? Why can we do that? Why can we share? Why can we be generous not expecting a return? Because God is our source, not other people. God will give us. God will... God will provide more seed for us to sow into other people's lives. God will meet our needs. That's why we can be generous as believers because our source is not other people. Our source is God himself. A generous person gives tithes and offerings to meet the needy in the city of St. Louis and around the world. They're not going to be able to repay us, but God will bless us and meet our needs. A generous person gives up their time to help other people. In all of their lives, not expecting a return, but expecting to be blessed by God, expecting for God to meet their needs. And so God has called us to value generosity and trust him to be our source. And so today, our message was entitled, Do You Have Jesus Values? And so after studying what Jesus taught this morning, we can all agree myself included, I have room to grow in valuing the things that Jesus does. Valuing, first of all, healing. Jesus valued healing. We're going through the Gospel of Luke in this series, and we see it on almost every page. Jesus healed somebody. It was a high value to him. It should be a high value to us as well. Praying for people to be healed, to bring healing into other people's lives. God desires for us to value humility. Thinking of other people is more important than us. Seeking to serve others rather than seeking to be served. God desires for us to value generosity. Taking of the gifts that he has given to us and using them to help other people. Because he is our source. And he is the one who has entrusted us with these talents and gifts 
And he is the one that will continue to meet our needs as we meet the needs of others. And so my prayer is that each of us, myself included, would continue to grow in understanding and in truly valuing the things that Jesus did and living out those values in our lives. Now to have Jesus' values, it's first of all, <clears throat> a person needs to repent of not having his values. In fact, if you're not a believer here and you're listening to my voice online, if you haven't submitted your life to Jesus Christ and you're living by worldly values, you need to repent, you need to turn away from those values, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, ask him to forgive your sins, invite him into your life, and submit yourself to following him and the things that he values in your life. So I'd like to ask us all to bow our heads right now. We're going to pray. If you never prayed a prayer like this before, I'd encourage you to pray with me or perhaps God would be leading you this morning to recommit your life to him. Say something like this. Father, today, I admit that I've been living life according to my values and not yours. I've been living according to my plans for my life and not yours. Please forgive me. I confess that that is sin. I believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. You paid the price that I might be forgiven. Please forgive me. I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive today. And I invite you to come into my life. I submit my life to serving you as my Lord and Savior, to living by your values and not my own. And Lord, we thank you for teaching us through this Example and teaching of Jesus this morning about some of the things that Jesus values. Help us to help us to truly value bringing healing into other people's lives. Help us to believe that you truly want to use us to bring all kinds of healing to the people around us. Help us to see people, the hurts in people, the things that need healing. And give us the courage, the strength, the faith to bring your healing into people's lives. Help us not to worry about what other people may think of us. But help us to be bold and to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to not be so concerned about ourselves. But to humble ourselves to serve others. No matter what they might think of us. No matter what they might say about us. Help us to be generous with our money, our time, our possessions, to help meet the needs of others, knowing that you are our source, not other people. And we thank you, God, as we do that, we're going to be part of bringing heaven to earth. We're going to be part of extending your kingdom here on this earth. And you're going to bless us in this life, and we're going to be repaid in eternity many times over. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.